So, so yes. this is a panel where we're going to be talking about the spectre vulnerability that uh, Chandra has just been sort of informing us all about for the last uh, hour and a half. Um, he did a fantastic job, I think you'll all agree. Um, and so hopefully this will be an opportunity for us to fill in any of the details that were missing. Not that I think that there was much that could have been missing. Um, and we also have some other members here who will give different, different perspectives um, on the, uh, the issue and how we might go about solving it. So I'm going to reiterate Chandler's ground rules, which is that there is a lot of things here that are sensitive. Um, we don't want you to be afraid to ask any question, but do be aware that there are certain reasons why things may not be able to be answered. There may be like legal or just general security good practices that we can say, sorry, we'll have to take it offline or not at all. Um, we would also ask that you don't try and invent a new speculation attack while you're here on the stage, oh sorry, on, while you're on the microphone in this public area. If you think you've thought of a, ah, I've got a great crack for this, keep it to yourself for now and then speak to somebody in a responsible way. But first of all, let's, let's uh, meet our panel. So I'm going to um, hand over to Matt Miller here who will introduce himself and then we'll work down and then we'll start taking questions. All right, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so as you said, my name is Matt Miller. Uh, I work for Microsoft. I'm actually in the Microsoft Security Response Center. So if you're familiar with, uh, or you run Windows, for those of you who do, when your computer reboots, you know, the second Tuesday of every month, that's our team, you know, we're making sure that vulnerabilities are getting fixed and that things are getting patched. So uh, I have the, one of the distinguished jobs of actually being able to see all the vulnerabilities that come in through our door and try to look for the trends uh, and the types of vulnerabilities that we're seeing so that we can go and try to systematically deal with those versus doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat type of thing. So. Uh, when Spectre and Meltdown, these other things came in our door, uh, I was one of the security engineers that took point uh, on our response to architect our mitigation strategy, uh, work with my distinguished peers on the right over here, uh, and try to actually design the mitigations for these types of issues uh, and ship them again, once again, on Update Tuesday. So that's a little about me. So I'm Chandler Carruth, as, as you may have guessed. Um, so while I work at Google, I, I was just going to give you a little bit more uh, understanding of how I got involved with this at all, because a lot of people here know me from working on C++ and LLVM and compilers and performance. And oddly enough, that had very little to do with what I just presented. Um, so I got roped into all of this uh, last year when they realized that they might need to change the compiler for some of the things that they were working on to mitigate uh, Spectre. I had no idea what they were talking about, but I was game. And as I got more and more involved, I started to end up like contributing a little bit more. We started to find kind of interesting new ways of using compilers to, to help with security things. Uh, and so that, that's kind of how I got roped into all of this stuff. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm John Masters. And uh, I have a role inside Red Hat as the uh, chief microarchitecture lead guy, I guess, these days. Um, I started out running uh, various alternative architecture efforts that we had. and. Uh, we needed someone who knew a little bit about the internals of processors, so um, that was how I got dragged into uh, Specky and Melty, and it's been the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to my, my girlfriend who got me the most awesome Valentine's Day present ever. She got me a Spectre Meltdown vulnerability fighting cape, which is <laughs> awesome. Why aren't you wearing it right now? I know. I, I forgot to pack it. It's awful. I, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. I am like, too. Like, come on. I know. But, <laughs> Terrible. No, so. I guess if you've got questions or you've been starting to think about things you might want to ask the panel, please start queuing up at the two microphones. Um, I get first dibs, though, as I'm up here. Um, so I write performance C++ code for a living, and I would like to know, how is this going to affect me down the line? What, what, what might I expect down the line? As maybe I am in a, a luxurious situation, I, I believe, from, from Chandler's sort of a threat vector thing, of not having to worry too much about it, but I'm worried that maybe my CPU is going to go really slowly just for other people's problems. Anyone want to take that? <laughs> OK, well, I'll give you some, some thoughts I have on this, right? So it, it depends on your threat model. Um, we have some folks who run in HPC lab environments. They build their own code, and they don't want some of the mitigations because um, they have a different uh, security environment. They have 
guys with guns outside, and the network is unplugged from the outside world. <laughs> so, you know, there are some times where you say, well, I've got to fix Meltdown because that's awful and very easily exploitable, but, you know, some contrived branch predictor attack or something like this, and maybe I don't need everything turned on all the time. So, one of the concerns has been making sure for those who want to turn these things off that that's possible if it's appropriate to their environment. Um, and, you know, I would say that that ability is getting better. Um, but there's some folks who are seeing performance hits who don't want mitigations, where you need to go and, you know, assess what makes sense for your environment, but you can do that. Um, and then beyond that, I would say there's really two different tracks. It's, it's um, things that are painful in the short term and things that are painful in the longer term. So things that are painful in the short term include things like OS level fixes that Chandler talked about for, or didn't talk about, um, but alluded to for, for Meltdown, uh, you know, variant three, where, you know, there, there, there is a cost there, but over time you're gonna get new, they're all fixed now processors, right, in future machines, and your existing code, you won't have to change it, it will just magically be okay. Um, there are some things like Spectre Variant 1 that will live with us for a very long time, and that will have a performance hit over a longer period. The other thing I want to say is I think, I think the performance impact of this is something that people have a lot of control over. So, so you can really customize the degree to which you take a performance hit. There's a certain baseline of performance hit for the operating system to, to remain kind of secure in, in a basic sense, but past that, your, your application can opt out of almost all of these kinds of things. And I think, I think that's going to give people who are not uh, super subject to this kind of risk a lot of freedom. Yeah, just to dovetail what you said, it basically ends up being at the security the performance trade-off, right? So evaluating your threat model, trying to understand what risks you're willing to accept or what you can tolerate, uh, and that's going to control and dictate how much of a performance trade-off you're willing to accept at the end of the day. That's cool. So um, it's no time soon am I going to see an announcement from Intel and ARM saying, we're turning off speculation, we couldn't solve it, you're on your own, 20 times slower. If you never branch, then you won't have any problems. <laughs> it's a good plan. It's a good plan. Awesome. All right, we'll start taking some questions from the audience now. We're going to start on the left-hand side there. Uh, hi. Uh, in his talk, Chandler mentioned that browsers are especially vulnerable, and uh, I do realize they run JavaScript and WebAssembly, and, but they do it in different pages or in different tabs and even it, in different processes which don't have the same address space. So how does this make browsers especially vulnerable? They're like operating systems, right? Uh, so, so this is an interesting question. Uh, it, it might seem like from looking at, at some of the discussions around uh, Chrome and, and historically Firefox's security model, that they use process level isolation, that they're not going to be vulnerable to this. But there's actually a lot of shared uh, work and shared processes in even Chrome and, and Firefox, uh, unless you enable a special feature of Chrome called site isolation. Okay, and that shared state typically involves the uh, JavaScript uh, uh, VM. Okay, and so you do actually have different sites uh, running JavaScript in your VM. And you can imagine how this happens. So you have a tab, right, and it's got a web page up there. But the author of that web page isn't the only author of JavaScript running in that tab. You also have advertisements in that tab, you have lots of other code running in that tab, and, and code that you may never know the author of, right? You didn't pick the advertisements, right? Some ad vending system did, and it picked a random set of advertisements. If I want to, you know, have a lot of people that, like, get a lot of information from a lot of people, I can just buy ad space. Specterads.com. Yeah, right? And, and, and I can just put JavaScript into that tab, right? And if that tab happens to be your, your email tab, right, or it happens to share a process with your email tab, uh, which, for example, you might share it between uh, a search and an email tab if they're vended by a similar uh, 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 company, then then you're going to have some little of risk there. There's a small continuation. If I... oh. Well, no, I was, I was just going to add, so ultimately the browser is an example of multi-tenancy, right, where you have multiple tenants, in this case site origins, in the same process. And one of the reasons that I think Chandler touched on in his talk is that um, these, in essence, are... Uh, more of a challenge because you're allowing attackers to provide you JavaScript that we are then going to turn around and just in time compile. Yep. So you can just in time compile your gadgets um, that can create these sequences that give you the ability to speculatively access portions of memory that you otherwise shouldn't be able to access. And that's why ultimately with site isolation you actually start to partition your tenancy into different address spaces so that even if you do get one of those gadgets you're not able to read 
sensitive content. That's the notion. Right. But since it, it is JIT compiled, uh, I have no way of knowing which address with the, the instructions will get. Like, I, how will I know which uh, branch predictions this poison is, in this way? I totally understand. It, I, I really did not understand this when I first heard about it from people like Matt. They were trying to explain how the browser exploits work. Um, I, I, I actually had the, the, the browser people that I work with had to kind of you know really work to get me to understand this. Part of the problem is you can do more than you think you can. For example, you don't have to know the address at which your branch needs to be in order to collide in that in that hash table, right? Instead, you can just put branches at a lot of places and see which one causes the branch that's supposed to be using that slot to get slower, right? You can just kind of find collisions. And then they, they ended up going after gadgets that are even easier to build out of kind of JIT compiled code. And for example, uh, variant four, it turns out, is just incredibly easy to hit if you're doing JIT compiled code. They tried a bunch of things to actually change the JIT to mitigate this. And I mean a bunch of things. Uh, people on the V8 team did, people in the JavaScript core team did for WebKit, people at Microsoft did. Like tons of the browser vendors worked on trying to just change the JIT so that you didn't have enough information. And ultimately, nothing worked. Everything would end up failing on some interesting, exciting code pattern. And so that's why they're moving towards uh, an isolation model. And um, Linux has, if you take the, uh, the browser example, but not a browser, but uh, um, anything involving JITs, right? You have similar kind of abuse. So there's something in Linux I like to call a Spectre Accelerator, um, uh, BPF. Oh, BPF. Uh, so, you know, people are like, oh, I'll put BPF programs everywhere. These are little, you know, code that I give you that you run inside the kernel very handily for me um, that's that's safe because it's byte compiled and it's, it's definitely safe, it's all fine because we checked it, we made sure it didn't do anything bad, right? Um, but anyway, I call BPF a Spectre Accelerator because it's just wonderful. You, you give, you hand me that, I run it, and I leak results. It's great. Thank you. Cool, we'll, we'll take a question over on the, uh, that side. Yes. Hey, I would like to know uh, what is the impact of Spectre family of problems on the cloud providers? Uh, should we expect like some continuous VM reboots happening from now on forever until they find mitigation? <laughs> and another thing is, should we expect some more legalese in the agreements saying, oh, your data can be breached, so sorry. I, I, I don't really <laughs> think you should expect this stuff. Um, Here's the thing, right? The cloud vendors, their, their fundamental business model is protecting your data. They're going to go to the mat to try and beat these kinds of vulnerabilities and find ways to protect your data. And all the cloud vendors are doing a phenomenal job here. And I do, I do mean literally every single cloud vendor is, has been mo the most impressive response I've seen to these kinds of issues. Uh, the one which has the most impact has been L1TI. And if you look at any of the cloud vendors, they have uh, documentation about what they're changing in order to mitigate L1TI. That's the most visible change that we've seen. I don't want to try and repeat it here. I don't have it in front of me. But all the cloud vendors, you can go and find their documentation about it. But it's not going to be constant reboots. It's not going to be something like that. The only thing you do want to realize is we are seeing a stream of vulnerabilities, I mean, related to operating systems and cloud, but related to all of Spectre. You need to have a good policy for updating your kernel in your cloud VM, right? which is going to require a reboot on a regular basis. Okay, if you don't have a plan in place, that's going to be a problem. There's a whole talk about, uh, in, in an earlier talk uh, from one of the security people, Patricia, I think she's, she might still be here, about how you have to have a plan to roll these fixes out. So all of the operating system and, and cloud vendors are going to have the fixes in place. That doesn't help if you can't roll them out. So that's what I would really focus on. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, ultimately, uh, vulnerabilities are, are not a new issue that cloud providers have to deal with, and so it's already been the case that we have to respond. Uh, these vulnerabilities may be different in nature from the other types of vulnerabilities we had to deal with, but that doesn't really change the fact that you've got to have your response plan, your capabilities, and your uh, the ability to actually go and control and mitigate for your customers. And I, I don't run a cloud, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put one. <laughs> so I have a bit of buyer's remorse. I kind of wish we, we did, but uh, you know, in over the last year working with these teams, uh, the thing that, that I've become convinced of is uh, if I'm running an environment, in many ways, I'm going to trust my data more in a cloud environment because I've seen some very professional people who, you know, these companies employ some of the brightest folks in the industry, these guys included, and, um, you know, I would trust my data more there, frankly, than I would in, in some cases in, a, in, a, in an environment with uh, you know, a system with firmware that hasn't been updated in 10 years and, and you, you know, there's, there's it, just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, it could be very good. 
Well, thank you for the question. Over here on stage left. Uh, so I I asked this question in the previous uh, talk. Uh, so it to me it looks like this is a architecture failure on the processors. The whole uh, the whole uh, uh, I will try to to figure out what's going to happen in the future, but I don't have enough information. Seems like a broken. <laughs> Uh, thing so, is there a way of fixing the architecture instead of trying to, to put band aids on it? Or <laughs> can I start this one? Yeah, yeah please start. One of my favorite topics. Uh, <laughs> anything involving architecture, I'll that's murder. why I had it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, well, so you asked, someone asked before about you know how big, how many instructions can you have in flight as well? And that really depends. On, it varies heavily, but but look. Hands up here if a year ago someone had come to you and said, I'd like to make your computer much slower, but I'm going to promise you it's going to be more secure. Would anyone have done that? And they won't tell you how much more secure, but right. somewhat but, more secure. You know, more secure, but it's going to get, you know, 30, 50 percent, hundreds of percent slower, right? You would, none of you would have taken it, right? Every year we buy processors, or every couple of years, whatever. Uh, and the processor companies have been beating each other over the head for the past few decades around spec numbers. Now, I hate spec. I think spec is a stupid thing, and I want it to what, go what away. What spec? Spec in, sorry. And What's spec in? I'm making you explain things. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> Doing my job. <laughs> in, industry, industry standard benchmarks. I'll just leave it at that. There are, there are some quote-unquote industry standard benchmarks that people use. They're very contrived, but process of vendors will beat each other over the head using them. Uh, and every year you have to get, you know, X percent faster at running these contrived benchmarks, right? And in order to do that, you've got to do something, right? You can't just get faster, right? So speculation has been the magic wand that, that they've used for a very long time in order to make these machines faster and faster and faster. And no consumer until fairly recently has said, how did you do that, right? It's really been this world of, of us guys in the software space, traditionally, kind of ignoring everything that's been going on in the hardware space. And except we just tell them we hate you guys, we don't want to ever talk to you, and we need our computer to get faster. What's wrong with you, right? <laughs> so, uh, so this has been a fabulous opportunity for us to have these conversations finally and start communicating more and also saying, I'd like my machine to be faster, but I'd also like to prioritize security. And now that now that we tell them that, now they can legitimately prioritize that trade-off, I think you will see interesting results. But I don't think we know what they're going to be yet. I think, I think we're really still trying to figure out how to make processors more secure. My call to, to action was to lobby with the processor vendors to invest in this space. But right now, that's essentially research. It's not even development, right? That's where we have to start. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Over here, please. All right, so uh, so far we've learned that if we've got software that handles confidential, valuable data, we should run it in the cloud rather than in the wild west. I get that. But I want to take that one step further and see how you respond to this. So imagine, here's the uh, CTO of a medium-sized software company, and he's learning about this stuff. And he asks about this application. They say, well, that one's all right because it's written in Java. And the Java virtual machine has been updated to, uh, to have mitigations in it. And then he asks about this other application. And they say, well, that's OK because it runs in a .NET environment. It's a C Sharp application. And um, uh, it's fine because Microsoft has got stuff in the .NET execution, uh, whatever it's called. And, um, uh, and what about this one over here? Well, we got big problems there. Why is that? It's written in C++. So there's no virtual machine sitting between our code and the machine, which means that instead of relying on all the experts at Microsoft and other places to fix this for us, we're kind of on our own here. Uh, why would the CTO or president or whatever executive of any software company ever want to have a, an application that handles sensitive data written in C++ or any other native language ever again? That's a great question. 
Um, fortunately, I do think there's a good answer to it as well. Um, you talk about the, the virtual machine and how you have experts working on this virtual machine or this environment to help to make it secure. But I think it's a mistake to think you don't have an analogous situation in C++. Um, how many folks here have written their own C++ compiler that they use for all of their software? <laughs> right? No one. But, two but, hands went to, up the, in the but now you're telling me I have to do a binary release. <laughs> hold, on, hold on. But like, no one has, right? Everyone's relying on their compilers, their tool chains to essentially uh, uh, provide that same kind of expertise. Now, there is still an update problem, right? You're going to have to do an update. You, but again, you have to have a plan for updating for security generally. You also are going to have security bugs in your code that you're going to have to update with. You're also going to have bugs in your VM that you're going to have to update the VM with. Okay, I, it's not clear that updating the VM versus updating the application is going to be a dramatically different experience. What we found, at least at Google, where we, we use a lot of Java code, we also use a lot of C++ code, is that the difference in complexity of updating these things, that is updating a compiler and doing a binary release, versus updating the VM that's running all of our Java services, is very comparable. In many cases, we can't do the VM update globally. We actually have to let applications pick the update when they're ready. And that's essentially the same as a binary update. Yeah, but there's a huge important thing that I believe that answer misses. You work for Google, which is, is a, essentially a form of SaaS provider. I happen to program on a SaaS application as well. Other parts of my company's products are delivered to our clients. Those parts of those companies are supporting releases that were done five to ten years ago because the clients have not up taken the upgrades. Absolutely. And, um, and, and I, 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 th I think maybe where your answer is going, and I would, I would tend to agree with this, is that if you're a software company, you better start delivering your software on the cloud or you're never going to be able to solve I, these problems. I want to make a different comment. It's not about delivering the software on the cloud. It's about delivering updates. Yeah. It does, Spectre is not interesting here. If you have five-year-old software, it has vulnerabilities in it. It has five years of vulnerabilities in it. You need an update plan. And that's not going to change because of speculative execution. Now, it's, it is, like, there is some challenges here. The interesting thing is we have more tools in our tool chains right now to mitigate Spectre than we do in the JVM that I'm aware of. I don't know about .NET. But I think, actually, if anything, C++ is at the leading edge here. And some of that's because of the risk. Uh, the risk is in some ways greatest when you have native code. But it's also just because the experts are working to make sure that the environment is prepared. And unfortunately, it's on, it's on you to then make sure that your update strategy is in place and follow. One way is to move it to the cloud, but there are other ways that are just as fine. The key is to update. So to, to build on your point there, and I agree with everything you just said, Chandler, the, the, the point about the deployed binaries out there, right? So I work primarily in tr traditional enterprise. Uh, and Matt has a lot of experience with this as well, right? So I'll let you speak in a moment to that. But um, you know, when, when things technologies like Repolines came along, we looked at them and said, well, that's great if you can rebuild the whole world. I mean, I, I, I love Google so much. I, I wish I had some of the fun toys they have and so on. And I said, how do we make that work for us? Because uh, we've got all these existing binaries out there. And so sometimes the answer is a little bit different, and we have to take more steps to get there if we don't control our entire destiny ourselves. Um, but we can take steps. You know, why do you want to run? native code as opposed to uh, Java, very simply, for performance. For the same reason that everyone has always wanted to, I mean, if, it'd be very sad if the industry said, we're going to use more of these runtimes as an answer to uh, you know, deal with security issues. This is one set of security problems where we have some unique challenges that might require some people to ship new binaries. But uh, there are tons of vulnerabilities out there every day that require people to ship use software or make tweaks to their environment or update their CPU microcode or you know whatever, right? I mean, it's only going to be a couple of specific cases where you might have to release a, a software update. I don't see this fundamentally changing the, you know, the, the way the entire industry operates, other than hopefully we'll get better at releasing updates. Yeah, and I'm, the element that I would add to this is that the calculus, the calculus of evaluating which, like the language in which the application that you're picking uses, uh, Spectre and the other issues don't, it's just a new wrinkle in that already existing equation that we already had out there to evaluate which is the most suitable language for the scenario in which you're using. And so if a big part of your calculus was safety in the application you were looking for, 
you might not want to use C++, right? You might not want to go that route. And Spectre adds a new dimension to that, uh, and it applies kind of uh, you know horizontally across all of those. So that'd be one way I'd look at it too. But the update story is another huge thing. Let, what, what's the element, or how do you actually control for updates? Go ahead. Let, let me just add, and I, I appreciate those answers, and they're very helpful. Um, however, let me just cite one interesting uh, kind of historical counterexample. For many years, large numbers of corporations in the business world preferred to use Microsoft Windows than Linux because they were afraid of safety issues. Now, that was a period during which the number of vulnerabilities that were affecting Microsoft Windows was probably two orders of magnitude greater than those that were affecting Linux. Um, in other words, this isn't always about reality. Sometimes it's about perceptions. And I, um, uh, I just hope that we can publicize the fact that C++ is in the forefront. And let us stay there. Absolutely. I mean, that's why I wanted to come here and give a talk. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, we'll go over to the left, please. So I, I have a pretty good handle on, on uh, x86 mitigations, but, but ARM has similar problems. They also do speculative execution. So I see that we're having microcode changes and, and hardware changes for like Intel CPUs, but what's ARM's story right now? Do you want me to? Why not? <laughs> so, so I had the distinct pleasure of dealing with this for I think seven different, uh, no, nine different microarchitectures across a number of different product families. So the total set that we dealt with on the Red Hat side was very small. It was x86, Intel, and AMD. Uh, it was all of the ARM server vendors. It was IBM Power and IBM Z. So it was a very small set. And um, I certainly enjoyed over the uh, holidays last year uh, testing mainframe assembly code. That was something I, I uh, was you looking forward to all year it. long. Poor life choices. Yeah, and we got Poor to December choices. and I'm like, oh man, this is great. That's all I ever wanted to do. Uh, so, so I'll walk you through just a very quick summary of those. So um, it, it, different architectures have different knobs and dials. Uh, I'll try to explain the terms, right? So x86 has, has a, a, a fundamental design choice where, where a number of years ago they had, they had some problems and as a result, they introduced this concept called microcode, which basically means you can get this blob that you load, a signed blob, um, you can't see inside it, but it will change the CPU's configuration and it will change how, how certain operations execute. And also change what are called chicken bits inside the processor to turn things off. So when you build an x86 processor today, there's about 10,000 chicken bits in there. And that's because the engineers say, man, we're the best we never screw up, but just in case we did. <laughs> this little thing I've been working on for last year, I know I'm perfect, but I might have gotten it wrong, and then my job's not worth it, so I'm gonna put all these knobs and dials that let you turn these things off. So there's about 10,000 of them in the average you know, x86 processor alone, where you can turn all kinds of very specific things off. So microcode can do that in addition to uh, changing exactly how certain instructions work, not everything. Um, but that's what x86 can do. That, that's how you implement things like IBRS and IBPB and so on. Um, when it comes to ARM, they have um, trusted firmware. So they have something that runs at a lower level than the operating system, and they can provide new interfaces that the OS can call into and secure firmware. So it's very similar to having, say we have IBRS uh, on x86 to the fact branch predictor behavior, we have similar interfaces on ARM that we can call into and trusted firmware to do similar stuff. On power and Z, we have something called millicode, um, because IBM invented it, because IBM, right? Um, and it does very similar things to microcode. So if you're running an IBM uh, mainframe system, you probably already got a call from IBM. In fact, it probably, this is a true story, apparently mainframes, when they have a problem, they actually automatically put service calls in, because um, why not, right? So it probably already called home, and they probably Wait, already sent you an engineer to fix mainframe this. Mainframe can make phone calls? Okay. Yeah, when you get one, <laughs> when you get one, this is, this is why I'm convinced the Skynet will be uh, you know, a, a, a Z, right? Because when you get one, you, they put a phone line in as well, so it literally can call and say, I've got a problem, I need you to fix me. Right? So I'm pretty sure that they already, they already called all their customers and said, hey, we'd like you to deploy these updates. So, I mean, they've been fabulous with that. Um, I know we sneakily deployed a, a mainframe update over the holidays that none of our engineers were aware of to, to address this. So, 
Um, and then for power, it's very similar. They have milli code. So you will find it's a bit different, but it's very similar across the architectures. Are there any hardware mitigations yet? Because Intel's starting, you're starting to see a few, few, a few patches in hardware with Intel. I would say very similar. Uh, it's the start. I know that ARM has, has some initial uh, firmware updates that, that expose similar interfaces to the ones that Intel is exposing and that AMD is exposing. I, I do think that it's early days on hardware. You have to realize that, that fixing this in hardware, one of the reasons we did so much on software was because fixing this in hardware has very high latency. Um, and it's very challenging to do, especially things, like some of the things are easy. When it was a CPU bug and there's a, there's a chicken bit or something like that, it's much easier. But when it's something much more fundamental, it's just really hard to craft the, the hardware updates. And so I, I don't think you should expect those hardware updates to roll out really fast, but they're definitely working on it. And similarly, like the uh, guidance from ARM for conditional branch misprediction, which is I think what Chandler mostly talked about in his talk, is still around uh, the concept of uh, please add data dependencies and serializing instructions to the code paths that are susceptible to this, right? It's not a categorical thing. Okay, thank you. Cool. Thank you for the question. And I, I've seen the documentary film War Games. I'm not surprised at all that there's a phone line into the IBM. <laughs> I, I to, thought maybe to, after watching that, they would have taken it out. To, to oh. be clear, I love IBM, and I'm having a bit of fun there, but I actually think the way they handled this was amazing. It, it really is impressive. Yeah, like, had, like, like, I, I make fun of the phone line, but it is really yeah. impressive. We, we had a really good experience, just, just for the recording. Some we had a really good experience. <laughs> um, okay, we'll take the question on the right, please. So the, the impression I got was that the, the, the mitigation in software, for the most part, is about isolating as much as possible, isolating uh, code that handles passwords, code that handles uh, you know, confidential information, code that runs untrusted other code. Um, but I'm not actually sure how you do that. So suppose I have an application that needs to create an SSH link to something else. Somewhere along the way, that the, the programmers going to have to type in there the password to get their SSH key. And SSH key will be read into memory, decrypted, and sent over the wire, re-encrypted and sent over the wire. Um, what would need to be done in that program that you know is all running in one memory space to prevent that password from being leaked? So, so th there are a couple of different things here that are kind of getting tied up together. I'm going to try and separate them out. First thing is passwords. Um, passwords aren't that scary because passwords tend to be very ephemeral. They don't stay in memory for a long time. Using these kinds of attacks would be really challenging. You'd have to time it so carefully. I mean, maybe, um, I know that L1TF was able to be used for that, but most of these have much lower bandwidths and are much harder to use in that way. Um, I think the key data is the interesting case here. But it's important to think about how the cryptography works. It's not sending the private key anywhere, okay? And it doesn't need for the user interaction with the private key to actually be exposed. You can have a separate system that handles all of the private key operations, right? all of the operations that really involve private key, and has a very controlled, very rigorously enforced interface to some other trusted component. right? And then only that, only that component gets actually exposed to user interactions, and that component can kind of isolate damage away from the private key material. Okay? So that's, that's the kind of cryptographic system that I'm suggesting. If you look at something like uh, 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 TLS 1.3, which I'm not a super expert on, um, you may have to like take over at some point. But the, the, the idea here is that you can use uh, ephemeral keys that are only used for symmetric encryption of a single session. Right? They don't keep getting used. And you have to create them with a long-lived key. But you can offload that creation if you want. Right? You can separate the active process of encrypting data from the thing that creates a one-time use key. Now, the thing that's exposed to attacks has a very short shelf life, has very low value. The thing that has high value never got to interact with the, the actual attacker. And I think that kind of separation is what you're looking for. But I also want to emphasize there, may, there are going to be places where you cannot build that level of separation. And that's where you see people working to deploy kind of manual mitigations of variant one because they need at least one piece of their infrastructure to be hardened because it has to both have a secret and interact with untrusted uh, entities. Yeah, so I'm by no means a cryptography expert, but I'll give you a concrete example of how uh, address-based isolation can work concretely in practice. Uh, so Windows has a technology called virtualization-based security, and we're basically it's leveraging hardware virtualization to allow you to create a separate trusted execution context in which 
you know, your normal operating system can't read or write memory that executes in this other separate virtualized context. That's the easiest way to think about it. And one of the ways that we've actually applied that is a technology called Credential Guard. Uh, it used to be the case on Windows that uh, we have a trusted process called LSASS. It's the local security authority. It is what contains the thing that implements challenge response for communicating with other machines on the network for NTLM and whatnot. And it used to be the case that people would try to poke in there uh, to actually go extract uh, your hashes so they could impersonate you on the network and things of that sort. Uh, so instead, what we've done is we've moved that challenge, uh, you know, the challenge response protocol into the, one of these isolated contexts uh, such that the secrets that are used in there to complete that challenge response aren't actually available to the normal world. And so if you extend that concept to other types of key exchange protocols, you can, it's, a, it's an example of applying address-based isolation where you're keeping your secrets in a separate place that isn't normally available to everything else. So that's just one concrete example of how you could do it. Did that actually answer a question? Yeah, I, I think it did. And the impression I get also is that this is something that, that if, if there's a silver lining to this, um, the, the technology to, and, the, and the, the interfaces to do this kind of isolation are going to get easier to use and more more taught, you know, they're going to be taught more more commonly because, like, you're going to have to write your software this way. Correct. And it's going to help with all kinds of vulnerabilities, not just the Spectre family of vulnerabilities. That's right. If, if anything, in security outside of even Spectre and all the other issues, we've already been moving into this world of pervasive isolation, right, where we have more granular compartmentalization and isolation of components, and this is yet another good reason to move to that model. And to Chandler's point earlier uh, in his talk about, uh, we didn't say it yet here, but rekeying, right? So if you have a long-lived session, uh, most of these protocols support rekeying. Very few people use that. Yeah. But it's really rare right now. But like this is essentially we've got to push on the cryptographic community to really embrace these kinds of techniques and to prioritize them when they're building systems. Cool. Thank you for the question. So we're starting to run out of time, unfortunately. So um, we can try and get this done. I would like everyone to have a chance to answer their question. Right. Right. So, so the three of us have to actually be be like brief now. You're saying? I'm afraid so. Yeah, okay. I should have probably told you this a bit. Should pick the different but, panel. <laughs> um, so, uh, over on this side, quick question and exclusively We'll see if we can do a turbo three minute. Sounds good. Back and forth. Go. Okay. Are these mitigations that we're getting gonna be opt in or opt out? They're going to be owned by default. We're gonna be paying for this in a lot of software for no reason. If they're fast they'll be defaulted. If they're not, they'll be opt-in. Cool, excellent. Anyone? <laughs> oh, right, this side. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I've been noticing is that some of the mitigations that you have shown were almost as contrived as the original vulnerabilities, like the red polling, that, that is pretty crazy, right? Um, and e even the elfans, right? The, the, the fact that the elfans blocks the branch prediction is just a side effect. That is not the original intent of, of the fans, right? It, it's a full fledged. It's number. retroactively documented as doing that now. Yeah. Right. So, so, so it's also close It's to in the spec it. now. <laughs> so, so they've added to the spec. It's also more fundamental to how elfans works. Uh, right. On Intel processors, elfans has always been what they call dispatch serializing. Right. And so, so it actually does have strict semantics. They didn't document it. Now they yeah. do. Um, AMD is following suit. So my, my, my question is actually, um, so like at the moment if, if the hardware vendors are to fix all of this on their own, this is going to be very hard on the hardware vendors. Um, or it will have immense performance penalties. Uh, what I could imagine happening is that the, the hardware vendors say, okay, like we, we will give you a, a special contract, right? Like if you, if you want um, the, um, the speculative execution, um, you get like these special opcodes to put in your code, and then similar to how the memory model works for multi-threading, um, if you keep with the contract, then we still can guarantee that nothing bad happens. Is that something, a direction that anybody is going to be working with? Short answer, please. Uh, we, we won't go into the details here today, but certainly people have thought about it. Um, I would say one, one slightly longer answer. Um, other architectures in the past yeah. tried having speculative instructions so I'll say one word, and I don't want anyone to take anything bad, because it was a good architecture, it didn't work out, but Itanium uh, did implement the speculative <laughs> instructions, and that required you to modify a lot of software. If you tell people you have to modify your code to do speculation, then they won't do it, so. Cool, thank you. All right, over on this side, please. Uh, since there's no mitigation, and everybody knows about Spectre, uh, how come the world is on fire? <laughs> it's so hard. So I'll give you an analogy for this one. Uh, go back 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, 
some people knew about buffer overruns, but not very many people. And then more and more people started to learn about them and understand them and get better at thinking about how you can actually leverage a buffer overrun uh, to, oh, I can hijack the instruction pointer, and oh, I can go and do this and that. And the same sort of evolution happened for other types of memory corruption issues, such that now we're at a place where you look at a modern memory corruption exploit and they're phenomenal. They're works of art in terms of how people do this. So think of speculative execution as being where buffer overruns were 20 years ago, right? People just don't understand it yet, uh, and it's gonna take time. But, but people are smart and they'll work out of the way. They will, and there's also lower hanging fruit right now. Yeah. Right. Lots of lower hanging fruit. Thank you. Over on this side, please. Uh, hello. Uh, I would uh, first want to thank you for all the hard work and the money you actually sing in all this crazy problem because that's, uh, yeah, thank you because you are for all of us actually. And the question itself, uh, from the uh, presentation I understood that the specter is kind of a combination of the speculative execution and the side channel that I can leverage to actually get the information. Is it possible to battle this issue from the other side so I'll fix all the side channels? Yeah, so this is, this is a very long, you'd have to have a very long answer to this, but you can break down these speculative issues into the speculation primitive, the thing that allows you to speculate, and the disclosure primitive, and the channel through which you disclose information. And there are mitigations on either side of that equation that you can pursue. And I would just add, again, there's a very long answer. There are some great videos out there explaining the, uh, you know, but yeah, we focused a lot, not, not necessarily channel, but the industry is focused a lot on one side channel right, cache-based side channels. Um, let's not make the mistake of focusing only on uh, the ones that we see. New ones yeah. will be found and, you know, it's a general class of problem to think about. So, so the, the brief thing I want to say is, I, I've taken a particular stance in, in the response here to not focus on side channels. And the reason is we don't think we will ever finish finding new ones. Whereas we think we can actually attack the speculative execution problem in a much more tractable way. Um, there are so many microarchitectural states that are available to store information in. Okay, At the risk of one, one, adding one, one more thing, <laughs> it's uh, another way to think about this, just adding on to what Chandler said is, with any type of vulnerability, you ideally want to mitigate it at the root cause, not yeah. further down the chain. And if you go to the side channels, the communication channels, that's further down the chain, and you might get yourself into trouble. Sweet. Okay, thank you. You're not going to turn my cache off and my branch predictor off then? Yeah, it'll not be perfectly yet. secure. Yet. <laughs> Excellent, okay. Um, very quickly, very, very quickly. Quickly. Um, so most computers in the world are phones. You never talk about phones. You talk about servers and how you update with them. But phones have application that are running in parallel on the same computer. Haiku answers. Anything the phone, phone vendors are looking at this. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. Is there any sense how widely this is actually exploited in the real world? Nope. <laughs> Even better than a haiku answer. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the, the panel here for that. Thank you all for participating. And uh, yes, thank you.